So we're on the back end of this, and if you have been listening to the series or been missing the series, I want to invite you to um, go online and listen to the series in its entirety. We've been receiving a lot of comments about doing a conference um, with this called Make It and Not Ashamed, and, and uh, we're praying through that, amen? I think that'll be, come on, y'all, that'll be worthwhile, so we're, we're, we're looking forward to that, amen? We're looking forward, so keep us in prayer. But I just want to share just two verses of Scripture on the back end of everything that we've been teaching um, to kind of put a pause on where we are, and then we'll pick up. Um, we have some others that's going to be sharing um, with us. But here's what we, if we can go to the next slide. Um, but before we do that, let's just bow our heads in prayer, and then we're just going to pray just very, very briefly. Then we're going to move into our communion service. Father, we thank you for you. As we go into your word this morning, I am praying that a word of encouragement would go forth to couples, to families, to singles, to divorces, to widows, God, widowers, God, every person here that we've been listening and we've been learning on the issue of being naked and not ashamed. So as we come to the back end of this message, Lord, that Pastor Katani and I have been sharing as a team over this week, Lord, on these few weeks, well, several months, Lord, we just thank you for that. So God, be pleased today. We thank you for worship. We thank you for the gifts, and I open our hearts to hear from you. So we love you, we worship you, and we bless your name. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Now we've been dealing with this passage in Genesis uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3 specifically. We've been talking about that. And just by way of review from last week, we spent some time with Father's Day. We talked about the men. Then last week, Pastor Katani and I looked a little bit at, at Eve, and we've been talking about that. So here's a couple of things, and we're on the back end of the story. And I'm hoping you guys, if you're visiting for the first time, let me apologize for not having to review the whole thing. But I just want to share real quick, is that we see in chapter 3 that Eve partook of the fruit. She gave it to her husband. He partook. And they fell because they moved, and I keep doing this. They came uh, from this place of where there was no sin, where they sinned, and now they found themselves living under sin, okay? And so some of the things that we shared last week as it relates to marital relationships and just relationships in general, a lot of us don't understand what's going on, but we're fighting from a posture of having to be in sin. Does that make sense to you all? In other words, we, we were here living in the garden, and then in a couple of weeks, I'm going to pick just this last piece up because there's some important things I want to share with you um, as it relates to that. But here now we find that God punished Eve and he punished Adam and he dealt with the serpent. And here's what we saw last week. Number one, that Eve's punishment impacted her two primary roles, childbearing and her relationship with her husband. But then we also notice that the Lord said there will be pain in childbearing and, um, and the judgment or pain is also going to accompany um, rearing the children. So when he says there's going to be pain in childbearing. It meant two things. Number one, there's going to be physical pain as children are born. And secondly, there's going to be pain associated with rearing your children. Now, where we spent the most, a lot of our time yesterday, was um, last week, was dealing with the second part where the relationship with the husband was now impacted. And in case you missed that, I really want to highly recommend you either download the podcast, you can go to iTunes and get that and listen to it. This past Wednesday, we had some really, really good questions about that because now that God released this word over her because of what she did, here they are living now in this area where they have fallen, let me just use the term sin, and this is where the relationship really starts to get ugly because the issue that God said to her now is that your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And we spent an enormous amount of time trying our best to clarify and to talk about that. But today we just need to keep, press, keep pressing. Go to the next slide. Then when it, came, when it came to Adam, Adam's punishment impacted his place of provision or where he provided for his family. Cursed is the ground because of you. It's going to bring forth thorns and thistles. And it talks about by the sweat of, of your forehead or your brow, you shall eat bread. So we know this. And, and let me just say this real quick. It's important for you not to miss. Adam and Eve were not cursed. They were suffering the consequences of their sin. God called, cursed the serpent, and then he cursed the ground. Now, as we transition, um, before we go to the next slide, there's a couple of things I want you to lock into with me. Understand with me that when Adam and Eve sinned, well, go with me to verse 7. Let's read verse 7, and then I'm going to try to do this in as short a time as possible. Chapter 3, verse 7. 
Back up to chapter 3, verse 7. Let's go there, and then we're going to read this, and then I'll talk about the text that I want to talk about. Verse 7 says, you guys are there, say amen if you're there. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin cloth. Verse 8 says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the tree. But God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And listen to what the man said, verse 10. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself, right? And then the ensuing verses, verses 13, uh, 12 happened all the way up until verse 19, and you can read that on your way home. Now, the reason I want to point that up to set up what we're going to talk about today, understand with me that God said to him, don't touch this tree, I mean, don't eat from this tree, for in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. The enemy comes and the enemy lies to them and said, you shall not surely die, but you shall be like God, knowing good from evil. Now, here's what I want you to hear this morning as you walk to the text. They partook of the fruit, their eyes were open, and everything in them, they went and they did this fig leaf to sew it together to cover their nakedness, everything in them led them to believe that when God showed up, that would be the end. Okay, because here's why I'm saying that. Why are you saying that, preacher? When God came down, here's what the text says. Adam heard his sound, and then he went and hid in fear. Okay, then all these verses happen where God said to the serpent, because you did this, this is what's going to happen. He said to the woman, because you did this, this is what's going to happen. And then he said to Adam, because you did this, this is what's going to happen. And then verses 20 and 21, and the remainder of the verse starts to happen. Now, if I'm Adam, and I hope you guys can go here with me, and, and, and then God pronounces what God's going to pronounce, and Adam and Eve is left alive, here is where I'm at. Is that it? Is there something else you want to say, God? Oh, don't act like you wouldn't. You'd have done the same thing because you know you're expecting him to say, all right, I got to kill you. I love you, but I got to kill you because I did promise I was going to kill you. But God did not do that. It's as if he said, here's what's going to happen, Eve. Here's what's going to happen, Adam. And then there's a pause. And then verse 20 happens, right? And then go to the next slide. Let's kind of walk through this. I want you to see what's happened. So look with me. Let's read, let's read verse 20 first. Let's read verse 20 and then talk about this. And I want to, to set up what we're going to talk about to this morning. Notice what it says. Verse 20, after God did all that stuff, verse 20 picks up with a big pause. It says, then the man called his wife's name Eve because the text says, she was the mother of all living. Where in the world does that come from? After they knew they messed up, why is that in the text all of a sudden after God did what God did, right? So here's what we said. It says, Adam named his wife Eve, and here's some, some challenges with the text, right? In what sense now was Eve the mother of, leave it, of all living, and how may Eve be connected to the text, right, etymologically to the text? And, and number three, how does all of this fit into the context? And here's what I mean by fit into the context. You're being punished for your sin, and then all of a sudden, at the end of the punishment, you're going to stop and make this declaration. Okay, Eve, you're called, okay, okay, woman, or Isha, that's the Hebrew word. Okay, Isha, I'm going to change your name to Eve. What in the world? Where's that coming from? Right? Here's what I want you all to understand. This here is a perfect picture. Thank you for saying that, Deacon Brown of the grace of God after we mess up. Oh, I need an amen right there. Yeah. That, that's the beginning of a perfect picture of the grace of God after we mess up. 
Because here's what that word Eve, right? He says, I'm going to now, I've been calling you Isha, and they've been calling me Adam. That was our birth names, meaning Adam just simply means man, and Isham simply means woman, right? And that's what we've been calling each other. But it seems as if from the text, from what God just did, as if God has given us a second chance. So here's, here's what the, 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 the opening phrase says. In, in what sense was Eve the mother of living? It was a prophetic utterance that Adam was making, Phew, God's going to let us continue this thing. Oh, y'all, y'all, come on, come on. Don't act like you deserve to be alive. Come on, come on. God's going to let us continue this thing. So here's what he called her. You shall be the mother of all life. And if you were to do the background study on the word Eve from the Hebrew, it literally means life or life giver or life giving. And then when you say, how does all this fit into the immediate context? When you look at the context, they sin. And, and the man is blaming the woman. And the woman is blaming the serpent. And God curses the serpent. And God tells them, now your home is going to be messed up. And he says to the man, work in the ground is not going to be easy no more. And then he pauses. And the man probably looks at him and says, is that it? And God says, I got one more thing, but that's it for now. And that man says, it looks like we're going to get a second chance. I wish I had somebody in here. Because God had covered into them, be fruitful and be multiply and to replenish the earth. And does anybody in here know that when God releases a word, God's word will not return to him void? Does anybody know that? In case you're missing what I'm saying, the only reason your life today is not because you're all that good, it's not because you're all that precious, it's because God released the word on you before the foundations of the word. And God's word cannot return to him void. Even though you're messed up, he will, I wish I had somebody in here, he will grace you until we get to the place where we realize our preordained purposes and destiny. So what's happening in verse 20 is Adam and saying, God, I thank you, Eve. We got to get this right going forward. Come on, if you're glad to be alive, just come on, say amen, y'all. Come on, let me know you're excited to be alive. If you're glad, if you're glad to be alive, come on, say amen. And let me move, let me move, because I'm not going to be long. Go to the second one, second one. And then notice what happens. Notice what happens in verse 21, right? It says, and the Lord made for Adam and his wife garments of skin, and did what? I like this. Even though mankind died spiritually as a consequence of sin, God made provision to graciously allow humans the opportunity to live, don't miss this, in him. <sighs> spiritually. I need two folks to say, Lord, I thank you for your grace. <laughs> Come on, just fool me. Somebody else say, Lord, I thank you for your grace. Very, very important that you miss that. Go to the next slide. Let's kind of walk through this. Because lock into this, lock into this. Before we even read the text, understand with me that when the text says that God, this is me. Now, when, when God made lambskin, here's what happened. Adam and Eve had done what they could to cover themselves, but them covering themselves was not adequate enough to position them in the presence of God. So with their own covering, they still went into hiding, but God decides now to take the initiative to right the wrong, come on, and to fix everything and to make it right with them. And I love this because when I saw this, I couldn't help but go to Romans 5 and 12, right? And here's what that says. By one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed it upon all, because all of us have what? Come on, all of us have what? All of us have what? We all in the garden like Adam had messed up at some point in time. And with a picture that I really want to paint with the text is that we have made our own coverings. Come on. We have tried to shield ourselves. We have tried to cover ourselves. We have tried to fix it. But does anybody know the Bible still says that all of our righteousness are as filthy rags in the sight of the God? It doesn't matter what you do to cover yourself. When God looks at you, God still sees the sin. He still sees the mess up. He still sees the adultery. Come on. He still see the pornography. He still see all that stuff. It is only until God steps in. 
It is only God until God steps in. And he begins that covering process. So look at what it says. For in Adam, we all what? But in Christ, we're all what? Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Adam and Eve jacked it up for all of us. Okay. Your marriage is messed up because of Adam and Eve, right? Relationships are messed up because of Adam and Eve. Life is messed up because of Adam and Eve. But I thank God that it didn't stop with the covering that Adam and Eve made because if it stopped with their covering, we would be hopeless. Come on. We wouldn't be able to make it. We would not be able to survive. But I thank God for the intervention of God. Go to the next slide. Let's kind of walk through this. I want you all to see a couple of things. So here's what the text says, okay. So God then, he made a covering for Adam and Eve. So you know the text. It says he made, let me read that verse 20. It says here, verse 21, and the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. And I want to spend the majority of the time here just for the next few minutes to kind of bring at least some level of closure to this. When I look at this text, I cannot help but see a foreshadow, even though it had not yet happened, of the Old Testament cultic systems. And what I mean by that is that for atonement to be provided for, something had to die. Oh, come on, come on, come on. For atonement to be made, something had to die, okay? And, and, and what this text kind of hints at is God knowing that that was going to come down the road, he paid the first sacrifice so that man can live. Oh, come on. He, 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 made, he made this first sacrifice so, so my home can be right. He, he, he made the first sacrifice so everything could be, could be great. And, and what I like about the text is that in, when I look at Genesis chapter 3 and 21, something else died in my place. Oh, I wish I had. Go to the next one. Keep moving, keep moving. So here's the thing. So what are the benefits of God's covering, right? Then we're going to talk about what the covering is. Here's this. Man-made coverings, number one, are inadequate to grant us access into the presence of God. I already said that earlier today. When we sin, and we dealt with this extensively on Father's Day, here's what we do. We go into hiding. Come on, say amen, y'all. We go into hiding because we know our covering is inadequate. Go to the next one. Now, notice the second thing. But when God covers us to the death of his son, I wish I had somebody in here. We no longer have to walk around naked and ashamed. Oh, you got to get that. 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 The reason some of us are still embarrassed about the things that we did is because we don't know what God rightfully did for us. And the devil is still tricking you into thinking you're exposed. Oh, 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 yeah. And so lock into this. What nobody there when you did what you did, but you come in church feeling guilty as if everybody was there when you did what you did, and you act like they can see you even though they can't see you. I wish I had somebody in here. That is nothing but a trick of the enemy to fool you into thinking that you're still exposed when you're covered up. And what will happen is we go into hiding because we fool ourselves into thinking that everybody knows, everybody can see. And we spend more time worrying about what folk are thinking about us. Oh, I know I'm telling the truth because I used to be like that. Lord Jesus, when I messed up, I'd walk in church, shame before I even hit the door. And anytime anybody look at me, Lord, Lord they know. <laughs> Don't know nothing. But it's a head game that the enemy plays to fool me into thinking that the covering of God is inadequate to cover my sins. Come on, y'all. Say amen if you believe that. So when God covers us through the death of his son on the cross, listen, we no longer have to walk around naked. Come on, y'all. Y'all got to hear me. You, you don't have to walk around naked and ashamed anymore because Jesus paid the price. Come on, come on, let me get ahead of myself. The songwriter said, all to him 
Ah, yo, come on. Sin had left a crimson stain. But it's what? His blood has done what? I wish, I wish I had somebody, y'all. See, y'all just know contemporary songs. Y'all don't forgot about the hymns. His blood has washed it, what? As white as snow. You, look, look at this verse. Go to the next, go to the next slide. Let me read this verse for you. Listen, so God graces us when we sin by covering us, lock into this, with his blood resulting in me being acceptable to him. Let me tell y'all what that means and what's the good news in this. I don't care what you think about me. I don't care your opinion of me because you don't have a heaven or hell to put me in. As long as I am acceptable to God, that is all that I wish I had somebody in here. That is all that matters to me as long as I'm acceptable to God. Because I know it's not your job to clean me up. It's not your job to make me right. It's not your job to get me to stop. It's nothing but God's job to do what God said he's going to do. It's all about him. Go to the next slide. We're almost there. Go to the next slide. So here's what Hebrew says. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified by the blood. And without the shedding of blood... There is no, I like the King James, remissions. Yeah, that just sounds spiritual. Remissions of sin. So lock into this. Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves together, and they were still sinful because the fig leaves couldn't cover them up. But oh, the blood. <laughs> yeah, oh, the blood of Jesus. Come on. But oh, the blood. Come on, y'all not hearing me. Oh, the blood. That's why he killed that animal because the shedding of blood provided the covering they needed to now be acceptable in the sight of God. Go to the next one. I'm almost there. Go to the next one. So look, listen to what Hebrew says. If the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of the vile uh, and the sprinkling of the vile persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, I'll explain. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our what? Purify what? Purify what? Our conscience from dead works. Here's what that text saying. You think the skin of those goats did something for Adam and Eve? Oh, my gosh. How much more the blood of Jesus has done for you? And how much more... The blood of Jesus has done for me. Go to the next one. I just got a couple more slides that I'm just excited about. So here's what Ephesians says. In him, we have redemption through his what? Blood. The forgiveness of our trespass according to the riches of his grace. This is what Ephesians 2 says. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near how? By the blood of Christ. Let me tell you what that means. Those of us that's been hiding, you don't have to stay in hiding anymore. You can come near because, oh, I wish I had somebody in here. You can come near because of the blood. Listen to this. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the what? From the what? Adam thought, God, you sure enough going to kill me. And God says, no, 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 baby. I'm going to shed my blood. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to shed my blood so you can have life. Married folk, hear me. God shed his blood so your marriage can be restored. Single folk, hear me. God shed his blood so you can be holy. Come on. Widowed folk, listen to me. The blood of Jesus Christ is all we need regardless of what we did yesterday. It makes us right today. Are you hearing me? I love the hymn this because the songwriter said, what can wash away my sin? Yeah. The echo was nothing but the blood of Jesus. So it says that, what can make me whole again? He said what? Nothing but the what? Blood of Jesus. Then the chorus says, oh, how precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. He said nothing but the blood of Jesus. Maybe you don't know there's power. I wish I had somebody in here. There's wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. 
So when I get discouraged, here's what I said. Oh, the blood. Oh, the blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It cleanses me. It makes me whole. So I thank God for the fact that I am covered by his blood. Come on, worship team. I want to encourage you this morning. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter how many times you've been divorced. It doesn't matter how you blow it. It doesn't matter how you messed up. The blood of Jesus. Oh, come on, stand to your feet this morning. The blood of Jesus. Come on, y'all, the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. And I thank him for his blood because he gave himself. And what I love about what Jesus did, he didn't just cover me from the outside, but he placed himself in me. Oh, I wish I had. Inside. And when he sees me, he doesn't see Felix. He does not see my frailty. He doesn't see my failings. He doesn't see my shortcoming. When he looks at me, he just sees his blood. <laughs> and if that's not a reason, come on, y'all. If that's not a reason to thank him, if that's not a reason to praise him, I don't know about you, but when I think of that, Lord, I thank you for Calvary. Come on, I thank you for what you did. I thank you for covering me. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you've done. Come on, all over this building, take a moment just to bow your head. Just to bow your head. Come on, worship team. Oh, the blood. Just allow God to be God um, in, in our midst this morning. Just take a moment. You go before him and you say to him, Lord, thank you. Just take a moment to thank him. God loves. God cares. God cares. Come on, God cares. He loves us so much that he gave himself. The Bible puts it this way in John, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Adam and Eve should have been dead, but the grace of God. Adam said, Eve, your name, woman, your name shall be called Eve, life. We have life again because of what God did. God, I thank you for life. I thank you for life again. When I gave up on my marriage, I thank you for life again. When I thought everything was over, I thank you for life again. When I didn't know where to turn, I thank you for life again. So we bless you, Lord. We bless you. We bless you. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We bless your holy name, God, because of who you are. Thank you for Calvary, God. Thank you for what you did, God. Thank you for who you are. We bless your name. You're wonderful, God. Oh, we give you praise, God. We just worship you. Come on, say, just worship.